Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Narsen for the Basque Country Stage 2 recap. We've had no breaks with World Tour Cycling seemingly forever, but this stage race is delivering already a nasty Stage 2 with an interesting finish, 154Ks from Zara to Sestao. And all these climbs, I thought, I said yesterday, they look easy, sort of 4.1Ks, 4%, 3.8Ks, 5.9%, 2Ks, 6%. But they all have really steep pinches in them. A lot of them are really narrow. It was raining and then it stopped raining today. It was cold at the start and the ride, the roads were half drying out as they were riding on them. Then there was the main climb of the day, La Suriana, 7.5 k's, 6.2%. But the first three k's were the steepest uh, with 8.2%, 9%, and 11% for the third k of the climb. Flattened out at the top. And then you have a technical, I'm talking, whew, I'll show the, in the YouTube video how twisty it was, but super technical running to the finish with multiple hairpins, very narrow, poor road surface, and then a short flat section before an 800 meter, 7.5% kick to the line in Sestau. Quite a nice stage design, albeit a little bit sketchy in the rain. Uh, Roglic. In the leaders' jersey, Benji, did you think Yumbo really needed to do anything today? They needed to. There wasn't much to gain for them, really, was there? I think a stage win yeah. could have been a bonus seconds, true. But um, I think we both had a bit of an idea once it started getting pretty yeah. rainy that that might be troublesome. We've had a history with a Roglic, or at least Roglic has a history with rain, where it's probably not rain related, but it's due to the technicalities of the consequence of the roads in the sense being more treacherous that he's either a bit more stressed or less likely to try stuff on those stages because he's like, okay, let's not show it away with a crash on yeah. the descent and fuck up my entire season here. So yeah, we had that in mind, but I, I thought when I saw the breakaway go away, which was not really an important breakaway no. of the day that I didn't see it happening for the breakaway, and I expect the peloton to fight over it. And uh, there was one team that took control pretty much for the majority yep. of the race, and it was uh, <laughs> Team Movistar. <Yep>. Yeah, <laughs> Movistar. Why? Well, I don't have I don't have too much criticism for them today, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, Me neither. And we'll get to what happened on the final climb. But yeah, that break, as Benji said, not threatening. They got given three, four minutes. Movistar kept it in check. Yumbo committed, I think, Fingston as well to help chase Roglic is in a unfortunately it doesn't mismatch too badly his black rain jacket <laughs> and yellow kit it's not like the uh mutant ninja turtle belt or stuff Vingegaard was in the green jersey but uh yeah those two I thought they were going to keep Vingegaard close on GC uh Valverde for stage win potentially and Astana without a win this year with a lot of Basque riders in the Basque region in the rain got to be one for them. But anyway, Movistar brought that break back. It became a massive run into the finish in the with 25 Ks to go. They brought the gap to about 40 seconds. There was a lone SKP left in that break. Uh, I think for the Burgos rider, Oscar Cabedo. He got onto the climb. We'd seen Lushenko on the left hand side riding as domestique for Freyle, Aramburu, Yonizagire, and Fulsang for Astana. Amador on the right hand side for Ineos. And Gagan Hart as well pulling for a short while, protecting Adam Yates. Eddie Dunbar, don't know where he went today. He was protecting Yates' wheel, but I didn't see him since then before the base of the climb. Roglic pretty much just had Vingelgaard the minute they hit the base, and it kicked off pretty early. If you wanted to attack, you had to do it early. We got that, I think, because of the TT yesterday and Pogaccio losing time. What did you see in maybe the second or third hairpin Benji when they were just about to catch Cabedo. They were just about to catch the rider and, well, they had Carapaz riding near the front and Carapaz went into the uh, hairpin and, well, it didn't really turn out very well because he ended up hitting the deck. He slid out in the corner and who was in second wheel there was Pogacar. In front of him, and yeah. Pogacar was in front yes. of him? Pogacar was in front of oh, him okay. with Godou. Uh, I saw so Carapaz right let his wheel go. <laughs> <laughs> so he basically, yeah, Carapaz basically launched an attack for Pogacar. <laughs> That's how we saw yeah. it. But um, 
yeah, Pogacar, there's no real unwritten rule here because, yeah, it's not really a, a leader that's on the ground or something. So uh, Karapas hits the floor, Pogacar gets a bit of a gap, and he's like, I should, I should use this. Yeah. And he tries to push a bit more watts to get a bit of a gap. Godu tries to follow. And those two have a bit of a gap of like five to ten seconds. But in the peloton, it was uh, Ineos taking over once again, trying to keep that tempo and keep that gap as little as possible and slowly but surely trying to get it back well, as well. Which right away? Well, it was Yates. No, no, it was Yates doing it for himself. Was it Yates? It was, well, first, okay. Enric Mas. Enric Mas, mm-hmm. correctly, this is why I didn't want to criticize Movistar today because. They correctly, with Mas losing so much time on GC, they were running for Valverde stage win correctly. They spent Mas at the front chasing down the Pagacha Godu move. And those two were working in tandem pretty well. Godu made a, maybe needing a little bit too much encouragement to pull through. I think he should have been. He was a bit too reluctant, actually. And no. Mas pulls off. Valverde doesn't pull. Yates starts to do it himself. And then it's Mike Woods, big bridge across to Pagacha and Godu leveled off a little bit and I've got no photos for you because it was so narrow. They had the motorbikes out of there, no uh, press photographers, just a live broadcast and it was so sketchy. All comes back together. Roglic is in the drops. I'm like, oh, is he going to counter? Is he going to counter? There was a counter from a Kaharu rail rider. Other riders are looking at each other and then I think it was Shakman, big move with Igita and McNulty or maybe – Roglic was with one of them, but Roglic bridged across, just in the saddle, seated, not a big attack. Someone lost, let his wheel go. And so we had four riders about two-thirds of the way up this climb with two Ks left. McNulty, two seconds behind Roglic on GC with a good TT. Roglic in the leader's jersey, finger guard behind. Sharkman trying to gain time, and Aguita presumably going for the stage win after a bad TT. About yes. this, so we have a situation where Roglic is bridging together with Sharkman, and McNulty is with that as well. Pogacar sees that and decides not to follow that attack. Do you think he decided? Because McNulty, his teammate, yeah, he, he sat up. Really? He looked and he sat up. And he did not respond while being on the first line. So he was able to respond. But um, I don't think it's a good idea. Eventually, no. might not have turned out too badly. But on paper, if you're a team like UAE, you won't be betting your cards on McNulty in a group with Roglic. Definitely because, well, Rolich will eventually out-sprint him if this comes down to a four-man sprint. And in the coming stages, I think McNulty's going to have a much harder time than a Pogacar. So I think that was uh, trying to be clever by Pogacar, but I don't think it would have been uh, too great if that group stayed up front. But did they? Let's, no, uh, no. and let's hold that. We'll talk about that at the end. McNulty, is he a real GC prospect at the moment? But I agree, he's not. Hey, Roglic is not worried about McNulty in the group. I mean, that's a good outcome for them. Pogacar is behind. Yeah. So riders on GC behind work to bring them back. Like they brought it to about 10 seconds. They get to the crest of the climb. We realize, wow, this descent is so technical. <laughs> Bell Bow goes on the front. Uh, the rider for Bahrain, victorious. He's good in the wet. We saw him in stage 10 of the Giro last year, that rainy stage Sagan one, the hilly one. Bill Bow was really good in the rain. He starts descending and drops, I think, everyone except Freyla off the wheel. And Roglic is leading the GC or the four riders to the front. And he gets caught in about five minutes on this descent, maybe less, by Bill Bow. They catch up to them so quickly. And I think it's partly, as Benji said at the top of the podcast, Roglic doesn't want to ruin his season in the Basque Country Stage 2 IT uh, descent, especially after Paranese. So he's not going to go full. Schachmann, maybe similarly. Egita is he the best descender anyway? And McNulty was going fine, but they weren't working too well. They got caught, and it was pretty much Astana Benji, I think, leading through this descent. They had Freyle, Izagiri, Adam Baru, full sang in this group, four riders. No one else had many teammates, only Carthy and Egita and Ding of God and Roglic. And they bossed the front. They're all good in the wet, particularly Izagiri. And what happened at the bottom? Short Valley before the next ascent, and it was Astana attack time. Yes, it was Astana attack time. And, uh, well, the legend himself, Alex Aramburu, was sitting in that group, and he was looking He was looking at all the other riders and was like, 
these riders ain't looking too good. I, I, I'm so the best rider on on this entire. Uh, <laughs> well, Fry let teed him up first. And, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you got to give the man credit. You know, the goat himself. Okay. <laughs> he came to the front. And Frala teed him up, and eventually Adam Buda with a majestic attack out of nowhere. Everybody <gasps> surprised. It was really well timed, to be and, fair. Uh, it was really well timed. <laughs> it's also one of those typicals descending attacks where it's it's a bit of a situation where that group doesn't necessarily have someone that's taking on the uh, responsibility yeah. of of doing the chasing or doing the uh, the riding themselves, and then Adam Buda just has a. A chance to get away because nobody in GC is going to exactly. care if Buda gets away because on paper he would not be a danger for the coming stages. And uh, so, like Izagiri, what an attack it was! You think they? It, Keldon was sitting yeah. at the front. I think he saw his Aramburu, and he sat up. Ten second gap immediately. Yeah. Was on a descent where you needed to pedal. It wasn't it was a flatter section. Um, I think that really played into it. If it was Iz- Izagiri, they would have chased it back as well as obviously any other GC threat. And he built that gap up. They then went into another descending section. There was a really short section where the Astana guys rolled attacks that was flatter uh, before this next descent. And then, yeah, he got onto that. He was descending on the hoods, but still way quicker than the uh, peloton behind. Really stable, taking the corners really quick, but not sketchy at all. Every time he hit a white line, I was like, oh. But still gained it out to like 35, 40 seconds. We got the 700-meter pinch at the end. And it was really only Keldum and Chasing, who'd crashed, by the way, before the final climb. He His right hand was bleeding everywhere. So yeah. I think he was chasing for Shuckman's GC slash stage win. Eventually, Carthy paced for Gita's stage win, I think. But no real... I think Vingegaard went back to Roglic and said, do you want me to pace? And Roglic was like, nah, why do I care? Like, we're going to gain on him on the climb. He's not even going to be in the virtual GC or in the leader's jersey afterwards. And even if he was in the leader's jersey by five seconds, what's it to Yama Visma? So I'll let Benji call the last 500 metres because it is his man. Alexander Buru moves into the last <laughs> 500 metres with a good gap of 20 to 30 seconds. The group behind, well, yeah, Bora was spacing in there, but Astana riders in second and yeah, third true. position means they're blocking the tempo a tiny bit. If the first rider decides it's over, then those two are going to be like, okay, it's... No, I'm not going to take over. But eventually, Boros win the round in the peloton. But a uh, a pace there for uh, their men didn't really work out because the legend himself at the front, Alexander Amburu, was uh, getting a bit of a neck pain from looking behind every single second where the others were. But he was so powerful, he couldn't see them. And he, uh, he went into the final 200 meters and he was able to celebrate so, so wildly in the last uh, one meter. And <laughs> he didn't even victory. post up. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> he was too tired. <laughs> so um, eventually, uh, Aramburu won. The one day that I didn't expect him to win, <laughs> he wins. And and you didn't bet on him. <laughs> he, yeah, I didn't bet on him either. <laughs> and like afterwards, we uh, ob- I obviously had to post it on Twitter, Aramburu, yeah. And I asked, um, I don't know if you, you guys know uh, this person on, on Twitter, Pro Cycling Trumps. It's a guy that usually makes like cycling cards or... Uh, a canvas with a cyclist and like uh, animated stuff and he made a mock-up of what it would look like in my uh in my setup here if i had adam buru written on the wall so i'm going to try and hope that you can see <laughs> and this. you know i can edit the image yeah, I know. over the youtube video you can send me the <laughs> well, actual file this is more authentic yeah, man okay. <laughs> this is more authentic man <laughs> all right so yeah awesome clearly stuff. doesn't know i'm still gonna try and get afterwards. that <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> technology. Don't have a clue. All right. Is that his first ever pro win, Benji? Aaron Brew? I should know this. I should know this. I should know this. I think it's his first World Tour win, and it's uh, no, not his no, first yeah, pro sorry. win. First ever pro- World Tour level win. He won win. a circuit or the whatever. Yeah. Um, and he won a stage in Vuelta Borgos in 2019. So he's done some decent stuff, but this is the big stuff. Yep. And uh, he's ready to conquer the world now. Uh, this is not the first one. Well, this is the first World Tour win, but it won't be the last one because he's going to win a Grand Tour stage this season. I'm calling it. I think that's a good shout. I mean, Vuelta, I'd like him for a lot of stages, Benji. He, yeah, he's really good. So In uh, in 2019, I uh, went on to this, like, uh, not a betting thing, but a prediction thing where we guessed all these stages and so forth. And I put Anamburu second on, like, on like five stages or 
three stages or whatever, and he ended up getting second on like two or three instances, then the love for Ambudu is just, it's unbeatable, it's undying. It's my third favorite rider now. So reading out the results for this stage, Freyla made in a starter one, two. He won the sprint for second. Pagacha taking four bonus seconds, sprinting for third. Roglic a little bit out of position. Godu fourth, Woods fifth, Roglic sixth. Sharkman 7th, Landa 8th, Egita 9th, Valverde 10th. And I think guys getting gapped who are on GC, McNulty lost another four seconds to that group, as well as Ingugod, Buchmann, Fulsang, Kelderman, Chavez. Uh, Chavez kind of done. Enric Maas lost a lot of time. <laughs> um, he is she. Oof. 28th, 40 seconds back, 35 seconds back. Paul Snifwa, 35 in that group with him. So, yeah, not good for Paul Snifwa. I, I didn't expect him. This is not a stage for him. He's a pure puncher. He's not good with the climb like they had beforehand. Um, trying to look at any other. Ulysse, maybe it was a little bit hard from that final climb. But that's about it. I think Yamba Visma, a little bit concerning. Uh, Roglic isolated so early, so quickly. And Vingegaard was hanging on in that group, but not really able to pull for him. Now, Roglic should look after himself, but they got lucky today. Well, not lucky. It didn't really matter, but Movistar paced the break. So what happens in a rainy, similar stage later in the week when there's people in the break who aren't as unconcerning or non-threatening on GC, i.e. Jan Izaguirre, who's going to pace? Are Yumba going to be able to do it? Second, after the climb, no one was pacing. Now, maybe Vingogol could have, but food for thought, things to think of. I think UAE were trying to do, as Benji said, keeping McNulty as a GC threat. And it's not it's not really going to work because I went back and looked at all this data today over the last 18 months, McNulty, and he's, still, he's third on GC. And the what's he can put out on the TT bike are crazy. Like, he's 69 kilos. He did... I think 6.5 watts per kilo, 6.4 watts per kilo for 18 minutes on the TT bike at Paranis and Catalonia. Big numbers. That's on the TT bike as well with some up and downs in those courses and some corners. And on the climbs, then I looked at stage three, the one Adam Yates won at Catalonia. And McNulty seems to struggle from 25 minutes onwards in these climbs and he can't hold – Coos held 5.8, and he held 5.7 for the last, say, eight minutes of that climb, and he still got dropped. And McNulty was able to hold 5.6, 5.7, and then he dropped down to 5.4 for the last eight minutes of the climb and got dropped. He got distance, lost over a minute, and that seems to be a regular thing, lost over a minute on Porto. Now the next day, lost a lot of time on Piancavallo, all the climbs. you got to remember this guy put – 250 seconds into Jai Hindley in the Giro in time trials and finished outside the top 10 on GC. So the climbing's the problem. Whether it's not even the watts per kilo either, because the TT is watts per kilo crazy. It must be an endurance thing, or maybe, I don't know. That's just what I've seen. Um, but do you think he's actually not that far away, Benji, from being one of those guys who goes from not winning too much? to top five GC material in a climbing light TT heavy Tour de France? I think when it comes to the Tour de France parkour of 2021, it might be the most ideal parkour we've seen in years to fit to a rider like him. Because like we mentioned already a few times before and you just a second ago, is that he's a good time trialist, very strong time trialist. But when it comes to the mountains, he always loses time and he's just going to lose time because his weight is so much higher than his competition and he needs to improve a lot to try and improve that as well extra so i don't know i think that it's going to be unlikely that he's going to win something like a Vuelta because those kind of roles and so forth really don't fit he's likely going to have trouble to get into a top five of something like that as well the Giro and the Tour de France fit him more when it comes to the climbing because that's a steady gradient so i believe that he can keep that up but I don't believe he's on the level of the really, really light climbers on the really long climbs and definitely on the steep ones. So 
when it comes to Grand Tour parkours, the only one that I've seen in recent years is the one that is coming up yep. in the Tour de France, and he's on paper not going there. So I guess we're not going to find out if he could do well there. Because, well, Pogacar, of course, is their leader there, which is, is he not completely going? understandable. No, he's going on to the Giro on paper, according to the uh, okay. uh, schedules I've heard. Right. I would have taken him to the Tour, for sure. I mean, you give him that exactly. Wiggins parkour, he'd be lethal on that parkour. Uh, even yeah. even as a helper for Pogacar, because like he's good in medium he's, mountains. He's the kind of rider that you can keep on pedaling at the front of the group when it's like uh, a really long and not super steep climb. Then you can just yep. keep having him at the front of the group and set a tempo if you're in the yep. lead. So yeah, for, I don't for know. context, he's having to do forty to sixty watts more than Kus on these climbs. Absolute numbers to do similar watts per kilo. So. It's it's tough, and maybe you know this is Basque country. Maybe he's got a plan. If he drops two kilos, two and a half kilos, won't affect his T two too much. But he'll go from get, losing a minute forty five seconds on these mountain top finishes to being right there. It's Grant Thomas. You've already seen the script written before. Yeah, uh, it's pretty exactly. obvious. But on to tomorrow's stage. One hundred sixty eight k's from Amurio to Armalde, Armualde, Laudio. Hilly, medium mountain, nasty stage, typical Basque country, typical Alejandro Valverde, Astana territory, steep climbs. We've got 2.6 k's, 7% early doors in the first 15 k's, then 3.5 k's, 5.6%, and constant rolly climbs. And not, not a lot of them are categorized. But the finale, the last 23, 24 kilometers, is 2.1 k's at 5.7%, but again, undulating then 2.7 k's at 5.9 percent and then the finale the wall 3.1 k's 10.2 percent at the end and there's 500 meter sections there's a k at 14.6 percent so who you picks benji <laughs> break gc gc and my pick is Roglic on this one yep. um reason being that when it comes to Pogacar, the issue at hand is that he is behind one, so he needs to attack. And if he waits till the last climb to attack tomorrow, then I find it unlikely that he's going to drop Roglic. Roglic is better than him on this. The climb is basically made for Roglic. And he'd need to go on the climbs beforehand, but then the question is, can he, uh, can he keep that up? Will Roglic follow on those previous climbs? What will happen? We saw that he or she is clearly not strong enough to be a co-leader in this Basque country where we're we were thinking about that yesterday, yeah. but it's clear that that's not the case. So uh, Pogacar is their only rider that they can win this Basque country with. And from what I've seen so far from his attacks today and so forth, I don't have confidence that it's going to be too easy to do so. So I'm thinking that Roglic is ideal for the majority of the upcoming stages when it comes to the finishes. And the way for Pogacar to put Roglic in danger is more likely to happen if he goes early than if he waits till the last climb every time. Yeah, I mean, look at Puy Marie last year. Look at stage or oh, seven or nine of the Welter 2019, the nasty wall with Valverde when he just won ahead of Roglic, and they drop Pagatra. I think. Look at Paul de la Lowe's on the steep sections. Roglic gapped Pagatra right at the end. I think he's better than Pagatra on the really steep stuff. Uh, particularly these eight to fifteen minute climbs, he is the best in the world. And yep, favor for the stage tomorrow. I don't really see like Valverde's not on. Woods Benji, and he looked okay. To, look, no, look good today. He's looked good this season. It, it really works out for Woods this one yeah. this climb. Yes, but um, His team is it's clearly going to be Aramburu once again. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, Astana. Do you think we've got these little climbs beforehand? Do Astana try and break it up, threaten Jumbo Visma's team strength on that climb just beforehand? Uh, that's where we might see attacks. That's what Benji mentioned with Pagacha. If you don't want to go there with Roglic, stress him out. Those climbs are where people should try and launch something and then it can become turn out just like today. We can have a rinse and repeat of today. That's what I'd do if I was Astana, but maybe with someone like Izagiri, better climber than Aaron Baru, over a longer climb. Freile? Freile, yes. I, I, I think the likes of a Freiler could Kuchenko. fit. The likes of a 
Lutsenko, but the issue is that... Nah, he's more a long uh, off. Yeah, I don't know. I think that Freilo would fit best for the attack and keep Izaguirre for the final climb. But Izaguirre is just not that close in GC as well, so he needs to do other stuff as well. So I don't know if that strategy of waiting till the last climb is going to help out Izaguirre too much. David Guru can win this stage tomorrow. He just needs to be patient. He's a minute 15 behind Roglic on GC. I think if he attacks, if he stays with them and conserves as much energy as possible... Roglic won't be too fast about him going with the last 500 metres and uh, he might get a little bit of a leash. So Godu tomorrow, he looked good today, moved with the Pogaccia and then he still came fourth in the finish. Uh, what about Adam Yates, Benji? Steep stuff. Not a long climb. We know he's good on it, her feet. How do you rate him on climbs like this? I think it fits him. I generally believe that it fits him. Um, I um, don't agree. Don't. See him dropping Roglic at all on this one. So the only way that a Pogacar and Yates can do something here is attacking early or at the f- single foot of the climb oh. at the end. But that's already hard. Pogacar's got way more chance than Yates, in my view. I think Pogacar can still be there with Roglic at the end. And if Roglic makes a tactical mistake or leads them out... Um, and then Pogacar comes around at the end, Pogacar can win. but. Yates, it'll be interesting to see. It's interesting because we'll he will need to know I for think, the tour. Yeah, I think the the time trial is what's like keeping me a uh, a bit astray when it comes to Pogacarai. I don't know. The time Wind. trial gave me a bit of a uh, yeah. It made me scared about Pogacar in the upcoming days. I don't Never know why, scared. but I don't trust him one hundred percent. Mistake. Here. Never rule out Pogacar. Someone <laughs> write that down. <laughs> Benji ruled out Tadej Pogacar. But I like that's not true. <laughs> he said he can't win the two. He's washed <laughs> and should retire. All right, we like Roglic for tomorrow, and uh, let's see how it goes. Thanks for listening, as always, and we'll see you tomorrow. Ciao.